So I, I'm Robert Alsop. Um, I was born in Leicester, England in 1937. Born in 1937, I grew up, um, my, my, my memorable childhood was spent uh, through the war years. I left um, grammar school, completed grammar school, barely. Um, I wasn't great at school, wasn't that interested in what, except sports and art were the two subjects that I enjoyed most um, and did well at. Um, and I went to work in the uh, Leicester City planning office, um, not quite knowing what to expect, but I found I enjoyed it a great deal. And as part of, the, of that employment was um, they had uh, uh, provided a day a week release to go to further education and two evenings if, as long as I was prepared to put in two evenings a week. And I had two choices, one to enter planning or one to enter, enter architecture. I chose architecture because the school was very close by the planning office. Um, and uh, as soon as I got into architecture on this part-time program, I, I was hooked. I mean, I, I, I found my vocation. Um, um, so I, I did that for a year and then um, having um, done well and, and enjoyed it very much, I started full-time and I followed the five-year program in architecture at the Leicester College of Art and Technology. So I was a registered architect by the time I was 23. And by the time I was 25, I'd already built my first building, a, a school, a primary school. Um, the other thing that happened to me uh, um, just before graduation, I got into the final of the Sohn Medallion, the Royal Institute of British Architects Sohn Medallion Award. Um, this was a, um, on the basis of uh, a, a sketch of I'm a charrette that was prepared um, in, through the, through the uh, college uh, program. The, the Sohn also gave me a travel award so I traveled in Europe, um, mostly in Scandinavia, some, some in Holland, uh, which I'd visited before. And that was an, really another important step. Um, to realize in Denmark particularly, but also in Finland, that they had never suffered from the Industrial Revolution. They had a craft tradition that had continued from the 19th century onwards. And, um, so I was completely knocked out by seeing all this stuff in particularly in Copenhagen, um, seeing this furniture that I didn't really, I mean, I'd seen illustrations of, or pottery, uh, fabrics, all sorts of things, mostly utilitarian objects that were so carefully designed. And I also learned that um, there were more architects the head of population in Denmark than anywhere else in the world. So every building you looked at was a bit very carefully detailed. I did a master's degree, but I did that um, a few years after I um, practiced as an architect. And I think that was a very wise move uh, to already have experience. And uh, as I said, um, it was an unusual experience because of the times, young architects were given huge responsibility and which um, I was um, privileged to be part of. Um, so by the time I went to graduate school and I went to the University of Edinburgh uh, to study what was then called civic design, uh, there were only, I think, only one other program in Britain. Um, the, the University of Liverpool had a program. I think they called it civic design there too. Um, while I was there, I met somebody who was also an American who was teaching at the University of Kansas, who was taking the graduate program. And he suggested that I might want to go and teach architecture in the University of Kansas, in Lawrence, Kansas. And I thought, what a terrific idea that would be. 
and he suggested I apply for a Fulbright, which I did, and I received. There's a photograph that you'll see that um, of me ar arriving in New York, getting off the boat, um, showing my passport to the official, uh, and then took the train, the sleeper, which was fantastic, of course. Many people would say, well, why Kansas? And that sounds like the back and beyond. It, it was a very difficult adjustment for the first couple of months, maybe, but I, I found it exhilarating once I got used to the idea. Um, from the confines of Britain, in, this is post-war Britain when things were still not very good, <laughs> um, to this open society that seemed like there's no reason you that you could um, not do whatever you wanted, that you couldn't, there's nothing too big to it that you couldn't achieve. I taught uh, for two years in, in architecture at the University of Kansas, which interestingly uh, was in the Faculty of Engineering. So they offered a, an engineer, uh, architectural engineering degree as well as an architecture degree, which I found uh, fascinating. Uh, and then I, I went back to uh, Britain, to London, and worked in London um, for three years before coming to Canada. Um, in Britain, working as an urban designer, as we would uh, refer to it now, I worked as an architect planner. The, the term urban design really was not in common use at that time. Um, so I worked on some really interesting projects so on a new town, Redditch New Town, on a feasibility study for the redevelopment of Regent Street in London, which thank goodness was never implemented, uh, and uh, downtown redevelopment in um, Cardiff, Wales. Uh, three projects in three years, amazing projects. Um, but began to feel the limitations of Britain again. Um, having experienced Midwestern US, um, I was impatient um, to be more progressive. I had job offers in both California and Winnipeg. And because the political situation was so bad in the US at that time, I chose Winnipeg. And I went to the University of Manitoba as director of campus planning. I think the key thing for me in the discovery of landscape architecture as a profession um, comes through, in a sense, looking for a place for urban design. Um, what was Intriguing to me at the time was that landscape architecture was at a, um, an early stage in its evolution as a profession. It seemed very open-ended and undefined, which sounded like a terrific idea to me, um, a, a, a terrific opportunity. Architecture, in, uh, as represented in Manitoba seemed to be preoccupied with object buildings. Um, planning seemed to be preoccupied with subdivision planning and, and regulation. Landscape architecture seemed to be uh, an open field which uh, of, a, of a more integrated. What it was what was also going on at that time was when an Alratri was a good um, uh, protege from the, Ian McHargs um, and the University of Penn, and I'd, as I discovered later, many of the leading landscape architects in Canada were from that background. Um, and some of them, including people like Michael Huff and, and Al Rattray and Peter Jacobs, with the architectural backgrounds. Um, so it seemed like that was a, a much more natural home for me, landscape architectures. 
So in, in um, uh, starting with uh, working with Al uh, Rattray in the landscape, establishing the landscape architecture program, um, he um, introduced me to the to the profession, but he also introduced me um, to the to the program in landscape architecture. Um, and I began to teach in that program. I was essentially teaching what I thought was urban design to landscape architects. But I was also teaching some basic things like drawing and history and some of those um, other things. And I had uh, an interest in landscape in any case. Um, for me, there's, there's very few uh, divisions. Uh, urban design is, is largely an integrative activity um, it's closely allied to architecture, it's closely allied to planning, it's closely allied to landscape architecture. And it brings these, these things together. But it doesn't have its own professional discipline. It, there is no society for, landscape, for, for urban designers. Uh, and, and I think that's one of its great beauties in a way. Um, so I taught in landscape in, in the landscape architecture program. I opened my own small office. I met some very um, gifted people, um, both as students and as visiting professors. Manitoba, um, the program that, that Rattri put together was, I think, was very clever because Manitoba is not the centre of the world in terms of intellectual or um, um, a powerhouse where there's a lot of other professionals to draw from to, to, to put a good program together. So he was very clever in bringing people into the city. So Ian McHarg was a person who visited. Mike Huff was one who came frequently. Peter Jacobs came. Um, there were others, so there was a very rich program put together in the middle of, a, of the prairies um, for a few students to begin with, and there weren't many. Uh, it's, the program's grown now. Um, but it was a very rich place for me to be, um, rubbing shoulders with these people. Um, and um, so I, st I opened my own small urban design office and did work there. Um, and then decided it was time to move to a bigger centre, and I chose Toronto. I met Roger de Toy as one of the people, and uh, um, we clicked immediately. He didn't have a lot of work, but was prepared to take me into the office without uh, much commitment. Um, and I also met uh, I had met before Bill Rock, who was the head of the School of Landscape Architecture at that time. Um, and Bill called me shortly after I'd arrived and said, um, we have an opening for teaching. And this was in October, late October. I said, well, how the heck would you have an opening in t that time of the year? And somebody had left rather abruptly. Uh, and uh, there was an opening, so I had part-time teaching at the U of T um, and uh, some work with Roger de Toy in his office. Now, Roger's office uh, was um, very much like the office I would have made for myself. A, a small office about five or six people um, doing architecture, doing landscape architecture. The, there was um, John Hillier and Bill Rock were also there and, Bill, and Rob, um, Bob Dobbin. Um, and Roger was trying to put together an office that would do uh, these urban design projects, which m most people really didn't have a very good idea about what urban design was. You know, what is an urban designer? Um, is it an architect or is it a planner or what is it? Um, so um, we shared these ideas um, and um, 
work gradually came into the office. Um, some of it we, we, we garnered together. Um, and we, we got some very major breaks. Um, work in Ottawa was really important. The first job we uh, acquired there was the site selection for the National Gallery and the museum, what was called the Museum of Man, now has been changed to the uh, Canadian Museum of History, or the Museum of Canadian History. Yeah. The really important project that came forward um, through proposal was the ceremonial route study, um, which we did um, as a group, of course. So what we did there, and I think is, is an important lesson that we learned through that process, a couple of things. One is that you don't need to um, break too many eggs to make an omelette. That by careful manipulation of what already exists, you can restructure a, pl a place. And I think that was really important. The other thing I think is we learned a technique through that of how do you do an urban design report? Do you do, an, uh, do you do a design and then try and sell that design? Or do you try to we finesse what are the basic principles that you're trying to put forward of, about this place? that a designer should follow. You may end up doing a demonstration design that people see as a picture of, of a future state. But what you're actually doing again is setting up a framework, some kind of structure that somebody else then can follow. In the case of the ceremonial route, de Toyos uh, I guess it was even uh, de Toy Associates at that time, we in fact implemented parts of this urban design plan. Now, in that way, it was very unusual for an urban designer to be able to carry through. Um, and I think very important to the firm in building a reputation both as urban designers and as implementers. One of the really important things uh, people uh, through her writing, um, like so many others, has been Jane Jacobs. I mean, one of the current concerns, I think, in Toronto is overdevelopment. Just the stuff that she wrote in, in Death and Life of, the Great, of uh, Great American Cities was about cataclysmic change. And that's not a, a not part of one of the chapters that doesn't get much um, billing, but she's talking then at about urban renewal in the in the states and in Canada um, in in the sixties primarily. Um, but we're f we're going through cataclysmic change in in, in many of our uh, Canadian cities, particularly in Toronto, particularly in Vancouver. I think maybe to a little lesser extent in, in Montreal, where the scale of change is quite dramatic so that it is wiping out vast territories. It's taking out um, the texture and the detail and the uh, incredible um, memories that go with um, fine-grained environments that are so typical, of, let's say, of um, Kensington Market is, is, is the, maybe the best example in Toronto. But it's true of, of, of neighbourhoods and main streets and all over the city, uh, the older ones. I think we need to step away from that and ask ourselves, are we in our haste to 
redevelop, usually driven by, by investment decisions. Um, are we making things better or worse? Are we, we, we had a, a very nice expression that we used um, in campus planning. Save the best, replace the worst, and repair the rest. In other words, don't go after the best things and destroy them in the process of, of, of so-called redeveloping your city. Those are things, the very things you need to keep. That can go for landscapes, it can go for buildings, it can go for infrastructure. It, 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 it covers the world. Um, and I think that's a motto that we, we kind of need to re relearn. I reread something that I read in graduate school. And I hadn't known that I read it in graduate school. I hadn't re recognized it. Um, and I, w what she uh, writes about in that, uh, it's called The Exploding Metropolis, is the book that I read in graduate school, is this idea that you're seeing things from the street. And that, I think, is an important thing to think about for all designers. It's the experience at ground level. We are so hooked on plans and aerial perspectives and diagrams from godlike positions you know, that the, 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 to think about designing at the ground level, at street level, in an experiential way. This is one of the things that I understood through the uh, idea of use protection. The only way that you can test a view is from normal eye level. <laughs> one of the very big influences for me as a, as a young architect was learning about, uh, learning from Gordon Cullen and his sketches of environments, but always from ground level, and usually one point perspectives. And, and Jane Jacobs praises Gordon Cullen in that book, The Exploding Metropolis. I had never put, made this connection before, but it's been a connection for me uh, for, for a, a good many years. Um, so I think that's maybe the best lesson for any young designer, and maybe for the people who are judging, uh, maybe the general public, what designers are doing. They should demand of them the view from the street and not the fancy models from godlike positions. The general public has wisdom. You have wisdom. For goodness sake, find designers who are, are ready to listen to you and listen to your wisdom. Um, Try to find designers who uh, can suppress their egos long enough um, to listen to your point of view. Uh, but the reverse is true. I mean, it's like to be, you have to be a good citizen too, right? Um, the general public needs to be good citizens and, and to try to work with designers who uh, share that same value. Um, that, that recognize the wisdom of the individuals.